All right. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, there's still some folks joining, um, but that's fine. Good morning. My name is Louise Mistel. Uh, I'm executive director at Skyland Alliance here in Tucson, Arizona. Welcome to our coffee break this morning. Um, let's see. So just some logistics for folks. So we've got everyone on mute. We will be recording and putting this up on the website. So um, if you um, want to share it later with other folks, it will be available. And all of the previous coffee breaks that we've done are also on the website in case you missed one that you're really interested in checking back in on, um, on the Sky Island Alliance website. Um, and since we're recording, you'll be on mute, but we encourage you to ask questions. Part of this is, is interacting. So uh, you can use the chat box at the bottom of your screen in Zoom to um, ask questions. Zoe will be helping um, collate those and facilitate some Q&A with Paolo as we go along. Um, before we jump into introducing this coffee break, I wanted to just take a moment to say thank you to all of our donors who make this work possible. I know many of you are on this call tuning in, so thank you so much for your support of Sky Island Alliance to the donors and foundations that are, are keeping Sky, the Sky Islands thriving and wildlife thriving. Um, today we're going to be talking about conservation in Mexico. Um, uh, Sky Island Alliance is working in the Sky Island region of southeastern Arizona and northern Mexico. And what a lot of folks don't realize is actually more than half of the 55 Sky Islands that uh, we're working to protect are in Sonora, Mexico. So we're going to get to learn um, about how conservation works in Mexico. Um, before we dive into that, our next coffee break uh, will be next Thursday, August 20th at 9.30 a.m. and we'll be hosting the Patagonia Area Resource Alliance to talk about their work to protect water and wildlife in the Sky Islands around Patagonia, Arizona, where mining is a major threat among, among other things. So they've been a wonderful partner with us and we're looking forward to talking with them about their work next week. And also next week, um, the University of Arizona and the Tillamook um, Lab are hosting a series about the Bighorn Fire that occurred in the Santa Catalina Mountains here outside of Tucson to help folks understand um, the fire. I've got a grumpy old kitty here in my room with me. <laughs> to understand the fire and um, what comes next and how we might respond. And so I'll be part of that panel next week talking about how Sky Island Alliance works on restoration. And lot, there's been lots of great scientists helping um, share information about how the fire progressed and, and what, what we know about it right now. So that's um, a great learning opportunity if you're interested in that. That's next Wednesday, uh, August 19th from 6 to 7, 15 p.m. And we've uh, put links to both of these events in the chat box for you to access if you'd like. Um, I think that's it for announcements. So I will introduce Paolo Quadri, who we're very happy to have on staff. Um, he's conservation director here at Sky Island Alliance. He's coming to Sky Island Alliance with 12 years of experience in conservation science and policy projects in both Mexico and the United States. Um, he has worked for the National Commission of Protected Areas in Mexico on uh, climate adaptation policy and tourism and community development. So he's bringing a wealth of knowledge about conservation in Mexico and conservation science. And um, he's going to be talking to us today about conservation in Mexico. So with that, I will pass it to Paolo. And you are muted, Paolo. I'm gonna unmute you. Okay. Okay. Are we good? Can, we, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, thank you, Lois, very much. Uh, thanks for the, today and for having me on staff, of course. Um, so I, uh, this is gonna be a really brief and, and shallow overview of conservation in Mexico because there are you know, so many things to cover. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Mexico biodiversity and then uh, about how uh, Mexico has been for trying to protect this biodiversity and uh, some of the challenges that have especially related to uh, land ownership, land tenure systems in Mexico and their history. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what is happening current, uh, currently, which you know, is unfortunate, but um, we'll, we'll explore some ways of, of uh, 
helping too. Um, so that is the famous uh, uh, biodiversity hotspot maps that probably you all seen. And uh, you can see Mexico right there. So, you know, most of it in red, the old Mesoamerican, the central Mexico part, but also the Madrera and Pine Oak woodlands there, uh, those two fingers coming up. Um, so Mexico, it is indeed highly biodiverse. Um, and here's just some, uh, some cool numbers. So Mexico is fourth, ranks fourth in mammals globally with 523 species, um, 11 in birds, although that's not great, that doesn't sound great, but there's a lot of good competition. Uh, second in reptiles with 957 species. Fifth in vascular plants with a little bit over 26,000 species. But then just look at this. Uh, hopefully this is something that you will learn. It's first in cacti in the world. It's also first in oaks and it's first in pines. So these very different um, taxa in plants. And, and you find the, the, the highest ranking in Mexico. Um, and, and this is because, so Mexico has also a, a wealth of different habitats um, and, and, and different ecosystems uh, that ha are directly tied. And you see here the, you know, the main extension and distribu potential distribution of ecosystems in Mexico, but that ties directly into the wealth of climates and, and, and habitats that Mexico has. Uh, here you see some of the tropical uh, um, climates down in the Yucatan Peninsula and Chiapas and Oaxaca with the monsoon and, and, and savanna type of ecosystem. So you see the tropical dry forest cre uh, creeping up along the Sierra Madres. And then you also see the hot deserts and the cold deserts up in Sonora and Chihuahua, some, some semi-arid climates too in the Mexican plateau. But also, also look uh, at this central part of Mexico, right? The subtropical highlands and here in subtropical where the cloud forest and uh, a different kind of pine oak forest uh, dominate these central areas. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a key region too that connects to the two Sierra Madres uh, coming down from the north. Um, so Mexico by geographic history has been incredibly dynamic and rich, uh, especially after the Panama land bridge close, uh, I don't know, about five million years ago or so. Um, because when the Panama land bridge closed, then all the temperate taxa that was in North America and all the tropical taxa that was coming from South America, they uh, finally met, right, uh, for the first time. And, and they met in these mountain ranges and these variety of climates in that, that, that I talked to in Mexico. Um, so, and this is why, you know, it's, you can go to one of the corners of the country and you can, you know, potentially you'll be stepping on the habitats of these four uh, species in a, in a very uncanny encounter. Um, so that is, that is pretty remarkable. So Mexico is pretty biodiverse indeed, uh, landscape, species, uh, rich natural history. And this is why uh, civil society communities, different communities and academia, uh, they strive, they, they give big efforts between the 1970s and the 2000s, and of course after too, right? Uh, uh, you know, to try to cope and make, make, a, a, make a face to the environmental challenges of those decades. And among the many different achievements, um, one of the most important ones to try to formalize conservation in Mexico and, and, and create institutions that would actually be able to take care of our natural heritage and protect it for the future generations. And, uh, you know, among other institutions, CONAMP in 2000 was created, you know, after big efforts, a lot of uh, 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 dialogue and back and forth between uh, government and authorities and Mexican civil society. And, and that was a big achievement. So in CONAMP, it's essentially, uh, for those of you that don't know, it's the, it's the equivalent of the National Park Service, let's say, right? Um, it, 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 it's in charge of the federal conservation in Mexico, and so it would be, it would be sort of the counterpart of the National Park Service. Uh, but there are a lot of important differences in how uh, CONAM works and how conservation is done in Mexico. There are a lot of similarities too, uh, and I'm going to highlight some of those. Um, so what you have here, this is the distribution of land ownership in the United States. Uh -huh. So you see that about 61% or so is the private land ownership, and then about 3% it's a tribal, tri their tribal lands. Um, and then the rest, so another 36% or so, it's, it's public land, right? Either, either owned by the states over here, right? Or 
by the federal government, which the, the BLM has the, the biggest chunk in the Forest Service and the National Park Service actually only 3.4%. Uh, but all these federal lands have some, some degree of protection and different management uh, goals. And then there's a tiny piece for cities and counties. Um, and if you wanted to look at the, at the this is a, a map of forests, it's just forest ecosystems and how they own in, in, across the United States. You see, for example, that most of the family incorporate ownership is in the south, like Texas and the east. Uh -huh. And then most of the, of the federal or the public land for in, in forest ecosystems are in the west and then a little bit of north in the, of the state owned forest that's interesting in the Great Lakes area. And uh, upper near uh, this area, the other one that's probably. Um, and, and the story of land ownership and then how it ties to conservation in the United States possibly, you know, like just broadly can be traced back to the Homestead Act of 1862 um, that stipulated that back then any other citizen or intended citizen, look how cool was that, could claim 160 acres of survey land, survey government land, right? Um, and then 10 years after the Homestead Act, you know, because land was being, being acquired all over the place by, by different uh, people, different parties. So, um, I, uh, the Yellowstone Act in, in 1872, it's a proposed, it's created because to try to counteract a little bit some of the, um, uh, of this trend of the, let's say like land grabbing and distribution that was happening back then. And so Yellowstone as the first national park is created as a public park or pleasuring ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people, right? So you had this uh, well-intentioned idea of uh, being inclusive and try to protect these natural natural resources uh, for the for the future of generations in the United States, um, and and you know this is so this is then how parks have been called America's best idea. Which, you know, indeed, in, in so many ways they they have been. But we also know that there's a dark story behind the creation of national parks in the United States. Uh, a story of destitution and even a story of, of more than, uh, murder of, um, of Native Americans, right? So uh, it was not it was not the inclusivity that, 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 that the, uh, the, the uh, Yellowstone Act proposed uh, was not really uh, playing its role. Uh, and so a lot of um, Native Americans, this is Yosemite, you know, just a few years after Yellowstone was decreed. Um, uh, this is this is Yosemite, and this is which was particularly uh, you know, witness of, of uh, destitutions and, and, and violence against Native Americans for the creation of the national parks or, you know, some specific national parks. And, and in fact, in 10 years after the, the creation of Yellowstone um, and the first parks in, in 1887, the DOS Act was authorizing the federal government to break up tribal lands, right? Uh, and only Native Americans who accepted individual allotments were allowed to become U.S. citizens. So you see this, you know, this uh, uh, contradiction, right, of the of the initial um, uh, Homestead Act, and and you know how welcoming it sounds for everyone that wanted to acquire land, and then and then 20 years later, uh, these, these these very different policies. And you'll see how Mexico is actually not, you know, is, will have some differences and similarities in this. This is this is a map. Um, Will be grayed out of uh, Mexico's uh, property of uh, type of land ownership. Um, well, uh, not all of it, but so what you see here in the burgundy color, it's uh, the Arejido lands, and what you see in green are uh, co um, comunidades or community owned lands, right? Um, this is about 53 or 54 percent of the, of the entire country. The rest, what you see there, the rest would be individual private property. So these are the two types of uh, private collective property, right? So these, these are not public lands, uh, but they, they, so they, they belong to, to groups, not to individuals. Um, and I'll be talking more about this. And, and so private individual land in Mexico is about 38%, private collective property is about 53%. And then public lands have been changing in the, in the last few years. And I would say that is about uh, 4% uh, probably. Um, some of that land, of that public land, uh, we don't really know. Well, well, you know, there's some of those pieces they are you still know where they are, so there might be a bit more. So I'm going to tell an extremely short history of land tenure in Mexico. This is the arrow of time that, that we all love in high schools. Um, and in 
1821, when Mexico achieves its independence from Spain, uh, these two generals, these two guys that didn't like each other, finally decide to join forces and defeat the Spanish army. Um, that's where independence happened. Mexico becomes an independent country, it becomes uh, actually Mexico. Uh, and land tenure back then was a legacy of the colonial area, right? The 300 years of, of uh, colonialism. And so most of the land is owned by the church, uh, by the Catholic church, by post-colonial elites that just, just carry the legacy uh, into the next era. And, but also quite a few indigenous land that have been, indigenous lands that have been recognized uh, by the Spanish crown in the previous years. Um, however, in um, 1856, uh, when the two main parties back then trying to build a nation, the Conservative Party and the Liberal Party, uh, led by actually Benito, so the, the Liberal Party uh, led by Benito Juarez, and who, who uh, by the way, was a, the first indigenous president of Mexico, if not of Latin America. He was from, from Oaxaca, from a really small rural area in, in Oaxaca. And Lerdo de Tejada, they um, um, create what was known as the Leyes of Reforma, so the Reforma Bills or laws, uh, that included the, what was uh, named, um, what came to be as the, as the Ley Lerdo, which uh, formally was uh, confiscating um, the lands that belong to the church and any civil corporations, uh, including in, in indigenous communities. And, and, and the, the objective of these liberal reforms was to try to detach people from the land uh, uh, because, and to try to, to spur or to promote the real estate market because it was thought that by detaching people from being uh, from the land and being able to create mobility, that would, that would lead the way to prosperity in Mexico. And you know it had it had some some merits to it because um, um, uh, you know it, it is you know now we know that it's important to have migration across countries and across boundaries so that people can labor can move uh, where where the, the markets move. Um, so it was supposed to stimulate the real estate market, but guess what? Uh, of course, what happened was that the poor did not have the money to to be the purchasers of those lands that were confiscated, and so most of those land ended up in in the hands of foreign investors. And land uh, land owners uh, um, that came to be known as latifundistas, big latifundistas. So basically, what would happen is that things transition into uh, the hands of new liberal elites, uh, and then in fewer indigenous lands, right? Then, after the reform era, then uh, Porfirio Diaz came to power, which actually at the beginning was attending some of the demands from indigenous and, and, and poor peasants in Mexico. But eventually, you know, he became a dictator, uh, and and so all the, uh, the the issues and the frictions that have been carried since the late Lerdo and even before, of course, from colonial times, sparked the Mexican Revolution with icons like Emiliano Zapata, who completely the opposite than Benito Juarez, with his idea was that to create prosperity and equality and equality, what you needed was to everyone needed to have a piece of land, and so land needed to be distributed against every every you know every Mexican. Uh, and so these ideas of the, revol the Mexican Revolution carry a, a strong meaning for in the, in, in the form of the agrarian reform for the constitution of 1917, which is a constitution that Mexico is ruled by uh, currently um, through one of its major articles. And, and so in the next decades, what happened was that this legacy of, this, of the ideas of Zapata and, and the agrarian reform uh, created this huge land distribution era uh, called El Reparto Agrario, right? And what you see there on, on the graph, those are millions of hectares that were distributed in these different presidential periods. And, and uh, I'll talk more a little bit about this. Um, but so this gave birth to the actual structure, the current structure that we have of land, where you have ejidos and comunidades, comunidades being mostly indigenous. So those, was, those lands were retributed, retributions, and then a lot of other individual landowners in smaller uh, land holdings. And we can say that these, this era of land distribution ended in 1982, shortly before uh, the NAFTA agreements. And I'll talk more about uh, why this was important. Um, so you see these sort of bimodal shapes, you know, two big peaks of land distribution that happen over, this, over time. One of the major uh, promoters of, of land distribution after the revolution in the late 30s, before it was Lázaro Cárdenas. And then the other uh, big promoter was Luis Echeverria uh, uh, in the 70s, during that decade in the 70s where most of the deforestation in Mexico actually happened. Um, and um, 
And this, Lázaro Cárdenas, this first president, he was an in interesting character because at the same time, you know, what was happening with the parts, with those, so parts started appearing in Mexico at the same time, at the same time, right? So and you see it over there in the, the late 30s is when the first, this is historical land surface of protected areas in Mexico, right? And so what you see here is the first accumulation of protected land in Mexico, mostly through the figure of national parks. And this happened because Lázaro Cárdenas had in his ranks a, a, a guy called Miguel Ángel de Quevedo, uh, who he had studied abroad in Europe and the United States. He had sort of a forester background. And he realized that the way things were going with land distribution was that soon there was going to be no land left for the protection of natural resources, especially in central Mexico. So he worked hard. He created the first large-scale plant nursery for reforestation in Mexico. And he decreed, he proposed the first national parks uh, uh, in the country. Now, these became sort of a schizophrenic relationship a little bit between these two, between and from a policy perspective, because Lázaro Cárdenas, as I say, was pretty funded of the agrarian uh, distribution. And so here you see them both, I like this picture, uh, when uh, uh, the, the, I like to think that, you know, probably Ben Ángel de Quevedo is proposing a new park. Like a, this probably was a conversation, is I just declare another national park. And then last of all, saying, yeah, I just gave it to someone else. Um, and that's, that's indeed what happened. And you can see this, in, especially in Central Mexico. I, I, I was just saying, you know, how, how a bit of a um, schizophrenia the relationship between these two was probably because of the, you know, one wanted to decree national parks and Cardenas uh, continuing the, the land distribution process in some of these areas of high ecological value, right? This is one of the reasons why national parks, some national parks in Mexico only protect the really highest elevations because th that back and forth between who, who should own the land and, and the demand for land at the lower elevations. Um, so from a, from a um, structural like a, a, a land tenure perspective, uh, an ejido it's uh, typically composed of three main units. One is the parcel lands, which is the, the, the lands where agriculture typically occurs, where like, productive activities occur. And then the, another is a village uh, where like the settlement, the human settlement happens. And then the commons, which tend to have the largest forested pieces of land or the upper watersheds um, where the value of natural, natural resources exist. And these tend to be also some of the, um, the most difficult areas to manage. Um, in terms of governance, an ejido it's a, it has three main components. It has an assembly, uh, a sheriff or a comisario, and a surveillance committee. So um, the, the surveillance committee is important to understand because uh, ejidos and whatever conservation is happening in them, they, uh, they rely a lot on the surveillance of members of their, of their own community, right? Um, and you can see how these can be, get complex really quickly because you have all these levels of governance, the federal, especially if there's a particular area, the state, the municipal, and then another complex structure uh, of ejido below them. Um, so, uh, not an easy thing to manage. Um, so you remember that I was here the timeline again, and I, I was telling the story of, uh, of how after the revolution, the land distribution happened. So 103 million hectares across the country, but half of this uh, land, half of this surface actually could not be sold. It was not really in the property of the hiratarios, of the, of the, of the members of those communities. Uh, it, it actually belonged to, to the nation uh, through the president, and that, that's how the Constitution in 1917 had been uh, had established. And after 1992, there's another reform that allows um, individual parcels to be sold in Ejidos. So there, you see the, the pattern, they're trying to go back to what Benito Juarez and Lerdo were doing, and try to detach people from the land again. But uh, not surprisingly, doing things wrong again, um, they do the reform, but then the, Mexican, uh, the, 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 the government decides that it's not interested in regulating the market or participating as a potential buyer for any reason, right? So, and, and this, is, this is tragic because th this releases a lot of chaos uh, in so many ways. So what you see around Mexico now, you're driving around different places, just land changing hands all over the place and ejidos being parcelized and then the land being sold to who knows who. Um, and, and from a you will see from a conservation perspective, this, this is, this is uh, especially challenging. Um, so if, if, you, if you see what, what seems that happened was that over time, there was this 
these are attempts to, to do reforms and to, to try to learn how to manage the, the, the Mexico territory uh, you know, from one uh, different ideologies about how to do it, right? You have Benito Juarez, you know, after, after taking away the land from the church and the, 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 the loss of Reforma, and then, and then Zapata coming in saying, I well know actually that the pathway to prosperity and equality is, equality is to, to provide land to everyone in the country and to restitute these lands. Um, and then Lazaro Cárdenas continued with his legacy. And then the 1980 reform opening a market that became, became chaotic. Um, so, so the land reform of the 20th century actually has had really pretty negative consequences in many ways. And, you know, so for, for example, for from an urban planning and disaster risk reduction perspective, especially now under climate change, it's, it's really difficult in Mexico to try to uh, plan development, to try to plan city growth, uh, agricultural expansion, right? Um, also, from a, an environmental perspective, the deforestation continues to be rampant in Mexico. It is, uh, um, it, there's a lot of illegal activity happening in different places. Uh, it's, it's a lot of the hitos don't have the capacity to uh, either manage uh, conflict with other hitos or, or, or within themselves. Um, and so that's, that's been a big issue. Uh, the deforestation rates continue to go up. Uh, this is data for primary forest from uh, Global Forest Watch in the, in the last years. And if you compare Mexico to something like Argentina, for example, you know, similar sizes, different ecosystems, uh, um, and you know, similar, similar rates of deforestation, but the, uh, Argentina declining there, uh, reducing its deforestation in the last years. Um, Mexico is pretty behind Lat Latin America in terms of particular area coverage. Um, uh, that's the percent of protected area coverage on the, on the y-axis. And uh, there were also big consequences, not just for conservation, but for poverty and social development in Mexico because of the, because of the distribution of lands. Because if you think about it, um, what, what happened over decades was that Mexico got busy trying to reach out to these thousands of atomized and scattered communities that were created everywhere, right? That were given land sometimes not really good land because of course a lot of the poorer people got distributed you know what they got was uh, the most marginal lands in different places Me mexico is not naturally a, a great agricultural country you think about it there's uh, enough water in the south but really poor soils and mountains and good soils in the north but not a lot of water right um and so a lot of this distribution what was forcing the government and and and, and during the next decade was to try to bring electricity public education uh, public health services to these thousands and thousands of communities everywhere. Um, particularly slowing down the, the rate of urbanization for Mexico compared to other countries in Latin America. You see Mexico down here in blue, right? Um, and that became a challenge too because, you know, if you look at the relationship between urban population and human development index, you know, across a lot of different countries in the world, you see that those countries that manage to urbanize faster and neutralize faster are the ones that have the uh, uh, you know, greater levels of human development. And so over here, you would have those countries as you know, whatever, Switzerland and Germany, and then the poorer countries down here. Um, if you look at the 32 Mexican states, so these are each point here represents a state in Mexico, right? If you look at uh, rural population over here, the share of rural population in extreme poverty, uh, you see that the relationship is pretty striking, right? And these would, these would be the states of Oaxaca, Chiapas, and Guerrero, uh, you know, really pushing the exponential relationship there between these two, two variables. Um, and we know that poverty in, in a lot of these tropical countries overlaps with biodiversity. So this is vertebrate richness, for example, just as, just as an example here, and then extreme poverty on the x-axis. And so you see how there, you know, there's a little bit of a relationship between these two, with some exceptions, uh, like Sonora, for example, which is not a poor state uh, really compared to other Mexican states. Uh, so it's down here in, in terms of extreme poverty, but it has really high richness and biodiversity. Um, so, um, so how has Mexico tried to cope with, uh, with these challenges from a conservation perspective, from these legacies of like back and forth, different land reforms and the complicated, confused uh, history? And, uh, so, Mexico has, wait, sorry. Um, there, there are multiple instruments in Mexico. I'm gonna talk just uh, about a few, some of the most important ones. Mexico has federal protected areas, uh, state protected areas, 
there are areas destined voluntarily to conservation. This is uh, for private lands. And units of man or environmental management or UMAS. There are also Ramsar sites that are typically managed by CONAM through international law. Um, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna, not going to talk about those. Um, so here's a map of all the protected areas in Mexico. Um, this is pretty current, and you see in green you see the federal protected areas. Uh, in yellow you see the state protected areas, and then in orange these are the ABDCs, so the voluntary areas for conservation in private land. Uh, there's a little bit of a, you know, those are tiny, right? And a lot of them you find them over here in Oaxaca and Chiapas. And then I'm just making these figures so that you can see where. Some are in our Sky Island region. Um, so federal protected areas, um, they, they, they're managed by CONEM, as I was saying, by the National Service of Mexico, let's say. There are 182 total and covering about 90 million hectares, but only 20 million happen in land, right? So conservation in land, Mexico is behind because the, the, the systems of land tenure make it difficult to negotiate these protected areas. Uh, you have to convince everyone, all the landowners, uh, in a lot of cases, is a lot of work. Um, and importantly, uh, these protected areas, the federal ones, they're divided into six different categories that sort of match or relate to the, to the categories of the IUCN. Uh, there are national parks, biosphere reserves, areas of wildlife protection, and areas of natural resource protection, sanctuaries, and natural monuments. Um, national parks tend to be the oldest ones, the ones that Miguel Angel de Quevedo back then in the 30s and 40s was creating. Biosphere reserves tend to be the most successful. Typically, they, they tend to have a bit more resources and their flexibility and uh, they're, they're well-crafted for a country like Mexico, so they tend to be pretty successful. Uh, but you have to think, it's important to think that all these particular areas, or most of them, they actually fall on someone's property most of the time. So what you see here in orange, that um, of, within protected areas, federal protected areas that are either in comunidades land or in ejidos land, and then the rest in green probably fall under someone's individual private property, and only about 50% or perhaps a little bit more is in public land for protected areas. This is relevant, this is interesting because this means that whatever uh, restrictions through protected areas uh, come, you know, the, the restrictions on natural resource usage or uh, all that. Uh, uh, all those things, they, they follow, they, the, the burden is on someone or a, a community or an individual, right? Um, they're, not, uh, they're not public lands. And so the, the weight of carrying up the area falls on there a few individuals as opposed to uh, uh, the state. Um, state protected areas, I'm not gonna talk a lot about them because they're essentially paper parks. Uh, so you see the, the percent of state protected areas and this is just, the, the level of staffing they have. So only this tiny amount has all the optimal staff and then sufficient, and then all these is insufficient or non staff at all. So these are de facto paper parts. Uh, although I'll show you something interesting with it. Uh, areas that are voluntarily destined to conservation uh, are a relatively new instrument that has been really successful and that it's actually, uh, they work through CONAM, uh, the certification happens through CONAM. And these are private landowners or communities that want to uh, voluntarily create uh, sort of a particular area in their lands, right? And these are, these are um, interesting because they're flexible for, they're, it's a flexible private modality that fits the needs of the land, like the, 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 the characteristics of the land and the landowners. Uh, it can be enforceable against third parties. Um, However, you saw them, they're tiny, they're not feasible at larger scales, but they work great when, as an as a instrument for ecological connectivity be, between larger, larger protected areas. Um, this is, and by the way, well, and, and this is one of the great achievements for private conservation that has been led by CONAP in the, in the past years. Uh, then there are the units of environmental management. Um, these, these are not big extension, these are rather places, locations where there's a project to do, do a sustainable use of local resources for, for mostly for economic profit, for economic benefits in a sustainable way. Um, and, and they tend to have a solid legal framework and, and experience behind in Mexico. There's a lot of good information about this. This is one of my favorite ones in Oaxaca, La Ventanilla. Uh, and, and so they, sometimes they, you know, they could be uh, not controversial, but there's some people that might uh, regard them with, with some skepticism because, you know, they, some of them are for hunting, for example, right? Like, uh, uh, like in this case for the crocodiles, but they, they truly have uh, 
do wonderful things with the populations of crocodiles, like they, they sell the meat and the skin, but then they recover the populations of, of crocodiles in the Pacific. There's some big fat crocodiles that, I, that, I, that are really, really cool to see in these areas. But they're other for butterflies, they're other for deer, they're, they're for different things. They can be also for, for trees, for plants, for different things. And the, the, the challenge or the, the, the downside of them is that, you know, they're small, they're disarticulated usually from regional conservation planning, so they, they don't have a, a big impact in that sense. Okay, this is the Yucatan Peninsula, it's the south portion of the Yucatan Peninsula. All that is in color, that's been deforestation. Don't get too alarmed, so this map is not including uh, forest recovery that has also happened or regrowth. But this looks really bad indeed. Um, but what I want to show you here is that that dark spot there with no deforestation at all, that's the, the, the Calakmul Biosphere Reserve. And it's associated ADVCs and the state protected areas. I, so this, this is remarkable, right? This is striking. I mean, the, the, the effectiveness, even with challenges, with budget, with uh, just being paper parks, some of them, all the complications, this, this, is, a, this is effectivity right there. Uh, this is something that is really important, and and uh, and I, I think this is uh, uh, you know with, um, um, the, the legacy of decades of efforts by the, the conservation movement in Mexico. Um, now, unfortunately, during the past years, um, with these two last governments, in the second period of the last government with Enrique Peña Nieto here, and now with López Obrador as president. There have been unprecedented budget cuts, especially in the past two years with, with uh, López Obrador, in which not just CONAM, as you see here over in the right, but the entire environmental sector, this is the, this is the budget for the entire sector, you know, has been completely hammered and defunded, right? Um, and, and so this is tragic because, you know, the, you can follow the lines of how, you know, after the CONAM was created, for example, how things were improving, you know, like not ideal, it was not ideal, but, but it, the things were, were walking, uh, moving forward. And, and so recently this, this is happening. And um, where is this money going? Uh, sorry, this should not be like this, but well, mostly to oil refineries, like pet projects like oil refineries, and Maya, a, a train that would actually cut across the Calakmul Biosphere Reserve with uh, also waiving a bunch of environmental loss, in case that sounds familiar to you. And a program with no uh, design, with no evaluation or monitoring called Sembrando Vida that is basically providing subsidies to plant supposedly fruit trees and timber, uh, but which really has been incentivizing deforestation. And if you remember, um, I'll, I'll get back to that later, but so how deforestation has peaked in the past years, that, is, that actually matches perfectly with, with the, um, you know, we need a rigorous study there, but with the moment with the, the environmental sector start being funded. Um, so what now? You know, it's not like everything is just sad news. I think this is, these are the times to fight. And, uh, and so the first thing to do is that it's to support CONAM in case that you, are, uh, you have any, uh, any link to CONAM or you're, you're interested in helping. Um, because, because these budget costs have really impaired the capacity of CONAM to actually operate, right? They're in charge of 11% of the territory, but it's, uh, they have to leave their offices now. There's, they, they can't pay for even internet or gasoline. Um, it's, the situation is really dire. These are recent pictures of this office being vacated. Um, the only reason why Conan continues to, to uh, stay afloat is because of uh, uh, the Fondo Mexicano para la Conservación de la Naturaleza, which is a, a public private alliance of trust, a partnership that has been able to channelize funds to acquire funds and then distribute them into strategic projects across different natural protected areas. And they are the ones that are funding conservation in Mexico right now. Although of course, this can last forever. Uh, I, uh, Emily has, I sent her a link that uh, she, she might post in the chat for you in case that you want to take a look at the website. There's a lot of good information there and then the, the, the option for donations. Um, and the other way of supporting CONAM is by helping directly and by working with uh, some of these uh, nonprofits in Mexico too that have historically uh, worked with CONAM in, in implementing the projects on the ground. And so these, the ones that I'm showing you here, Naturalia, Profauna, Pronatura, and Espacios Naturales, these are some uh, NGOs that have uh, in the, the 
we know in the Skyland region that are that are um, that we've been working with. Um, so uh, contributing to their work is also it's you know it's right now is the only option actually to maintain Conan to work and their presence. That that's the most important thing is that Conan can maintain presence on the ground because it's taken it's been so much effort to try to convince people in these remote areas of how important conservation is and that they can trust Conan and this is not the time to abandon him. Um, another way is to support private conservation uh, through the, some of the instruments that I was, that I was showing you. Uh, just south of the border, for example, there's the uh, Ajos Avisto Reserve, which is a federal protected area. It's the largest uh, protected area in Mexico in the Sky Island region. Uh, it's about 200,000 hectares. It was a creek back with uh, Miguel Angel de Quevedo and, and, and Lázaro Cárdenas. Uh, but around, uh, around uh, um, Ajos Avispe, there are a, a group of, of uh, uh, voluntary conservation areas, right? And, and, and these are important to support. We're actually is trying to work with additional ranchers and additional landowners in this area to try to develop, to create more of these voluntary areas, strengthening their work in Mexico. Um, and this is the work that we've been doing with, uh, with Profauna. And so you see some of these ranches here uh, we uh, highlighted. Those are the ranches that we're starting to work with. And the idea is to create the capacity building enough for them to be able to become either UMAS or ADCs, and so that they can access to, uh, these different funds and work in things that are important right now, like soil conservation, water testing. They're, they're really concerned about all the mining activity happening in these areas. Exclusion areas for cattle, uh, riparian reforestation especially, and wildlife monitoring. Um, this is work that we're doing with Profauna, as I was uh, showing you earlier as one of the, the strategic partners of Conan. As you know, unfortunately, too, the, the border wall construction has resumed uh, in, 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 along the Huachuca Mountains and the San Pedro River. Um, and so we, we also, so you know that we have, probably you know we have our border wildlife study in place and collecting a bunch of different data and pictures of the species that are using these, uh, the, the, the areas that are still open that with no border wall. But we also have cameras, thanks to uh, our partnership with Naturalia, uh, down on the other side in Rancho Los Fresnos, which is an ADDC. And, um, and we have 10 cameras operating over there, collecting data on the, of the wildlife that, 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 is, uh, that uses those habitats. And we're also working with some riparian restoration in this, in this, uh, in this uh, ADDC through the partnership with Naturalia. So before I go, um, because uh, I think it just extended more than it should because of the pause, but I just want to kind of, you know, not to leave you with a bad taste uh, after this. And I want to show you a few really spectacular pictures of some of my favorite forget areas in Mexico. This is the one that I, I think I visit the most um, near Mexico City, Sierra Gorda, Bayoster Reserve. Um, I think if you like the Sky Islands, this would definitely make you go crazy. Um, El Vizcaíno, I also reserve. There's so many pictures that you could put of El Vizcaíno. I think this is a great, great image. The Cian Camp, I also reserve in, uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula off the coast of uh, Quintana Roo. This is a dual, I also reserve because it has a huge protection uh, proportion of land surface, but also of marine area. Of course, the Ajos of Abispe Wildlife Protection Area. The Calakmul, I also reserve, uh, which now the current government is trying to uh, put a train through it. The Pico de Orizaba National Park, the tallest mountain in Mexico and the third largest peak in North America, still has a glacier, a nine square kilometer glacier at 19 degrees latitude. Imagine the pinnacle in front of the Gulf of Mexico. It's a crazy place. Um, the Cuatro Cienegas Wildlife Protection Area with a lot of endemic fish, endemic species, a huge natural history. The Montes Azules Biosphere Reserve, one of the largest pieces of untouched uh, uh, tropical humid forest and uh, where also the Lacandones live. And finally, the Nevada de Colima National Park. These are all uh, pictures by great photograph uh, photographers. Uh, this is in Colima and Jalisco. And with that, uh, thank you. I'm sorry that I had those technical issues. I hope you actually listen to it. I'm not talking to myself right now. Um, but I'd be happy to, to chat and, and uh, take any questions. Great, thank you, Paolo. Um, well, I'll just let you know a few questions that came through and everyone else, if you wanna add anything else in the chat box, we can uh, bring that up as well in these last 10 minutes or so. So Paolo, the first question was, 
um, is it possible and advisable to donate to the Mexican nonprofits from the US and some of those organizations you mentioned? Um, yeah, so it, it, it is possible. A lot of those nonprofits, and you know, especially the Fondo Mexicano para la Conservación, they they are uh, set, set for receiving international donations. Um, you know, I don't know the specific cases, and, and I don't know how you know they, they probably have different different approaches. But um, uh, the, if you go to the Fondo Mexicano para la Conservación, they actually vet it as uh, by this you know cert certified as one of the. Um, um, most effective uh, organizations in Mexico for conservation. So, so, but yeah, definitely, I would encourage you to reach out to them and you know see what what can be done. Um, okay, so. great. Um, we had some other comments of people interested in in doing a Spanish version of this presentation as well. Um, so we said we can set that up uh, to get it out to broader audiences. We definitely, should. yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to do it in, in Espanol. Perfecto. Um, and let's see, we have a few more minutes. So if anyone does want to put any questions in there, we'll, we'll give it a few minutes. You would think that the, the virtual format takes away the shyness of the <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. We have a few more questions just came through. So um, let's see, any references or other reading materials you would suggest in, in English um, on protected lands in Mexico for further reading and, and self-education? Uh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I know of, 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 of you know, studies that have been done on the topic, but they're mostly papers that are like very specific to one particular issue. Um, uh, uh, if, if you, you know, uh, there's, well, so there, there's some information on the, on the, the UN site, on the um, Organization for Food and Agriculture about, about the housing with land reform. I think there's something published by Arturo Barman, um, and who was a, you know, an anthropologist in Mexico that studied for all his life uh, the consequences of land reform. Um, but I, what I can do, I'm happy to put together uh, a list of more general things that might be of interest of, of the audience and, and we can share them in our website or something like that. Yeah, that would be great. I think this sparked interest in a lot of people and, and want more information. So we can definitely post that on our website or in, in a blog coming up and share that. Um, let's see, we had um, one more question. Oh, how do these environmental issues that you mentioned rank in priority um, for people in Mexico? Um, so, so uh, I, I, I don't know if I, if I understand correctly, so I wonder if they mean whether the, the current challenges or the, of that, uh, like the mining, for example, happening in the Skyland regions or different things. Well, I, I think that that depends a lot on the, on, on the region here in Mexico. They're really very different. Same in the, in the U.S. Uh, down in Calakmul, for example, in Campeche, one of the main problems is illegal logging, right? There, uh, I know that there's a, a Chinese company involvement, for example, in extracting precious timber from the area. There's also a lot of frictions between different uh, communities in the area. Uh, poaching over there is a big problem too, and, and the wildlife trade. Um, in the same way that would be in, the, in Sonora with, our, with the jaguars, with the northern jaguars, for example, with like uh, some ranchers having conflict with the jaguars and killing them. Uh, but over, over in the north, there's of course the problem of mining, right? Which the, the south doesn't have as much. Um, so uh, the the order it would it would vary a lot from one community to another. But I would say that the, the at the national scale, Mexico has to stop this trace of deforestation, right? Um, that needs to be that that is one of the most pressing. Just because deforestation carries uh, you know all these all the, the, a bunch of other negative consequences. Um, so. Um, that is, that is, I would say that that is the, the number one problem to resolve. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see, a few more questions flooding in now. Um, so first question, maybe from a student, um, are there any Mexican agencies, um, you know, as they are downsizing and getting budget, their budgets cut, still hiring, looking profession, looking for professionals to hire and, you know, eventually partner with us, hopefully. 
Uh, I, I honestly doubt that the, the Mexican agencies, the government agencies, are going to be hiring anyone anytime soon. On the contrary, the opposite is happening. Uh, it, it is a shame. For example, for, for uh, I didn't mention Conavio, but, but Conavio has been this wonderful agency that has, was working with a public-private uh, partnership too, that generated for years, generating a, a really high quality information on the status of Mexican ecosystems and the use of biodiversity in all different places. And, and that Conavio has, it's been attacked too, it's been defunded. Um, and, and I'm just thinking of Conavio because I remember being one of the places that, you know, as a scientist, uh, for a lot of people that want to work, that's a great place to volunteer or to try to find a job, or it was, right? But right now, I think that is going to be increasing. But I, I, opportunities might open in these satellite organizations that are, that are trying to help Conan. And so, it's, you know, that would be the place to look for, I would say. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next up, we have a question. How much activity is there in buying up parcels for conservation projects? Uh, for example, similar to what the Northern Jaguar project has done. Uh, is there for me? Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a great question because I, I, I didn't talk about that, but I think on the longer term, I think, uh, you know, whenever things change and get better, that Mexico should be looking at, at becoming, or the, the government should be looking at participating in this land market that was open after the reform the way that, that, that I mentioned. Uh, because a lot of people might be looking to sell their lands, right? And, and it would be better if we we're buying these, these lands for conservation or for planning purposes as opposed to just changing hands who knows where. Now, having the capacity, the government having the capacity of first doing those purchases and then managing them is a different story. That's, that's, that would be really quite challenging, but that doesn't mean that we should not aim for that. Um, in terms of for private conservation, there are options to do that. I, I know of, uh, of other, other few places that either from ejidos or from individual privately owned, they, they, they can be land purchases. Um, but buying lands from ejidos, uh, from uh, collective uh, property, it's complicated, right? Because, because it has to go through all these different uh, bodies of governance and the decision, it, it, it takes some time. Um, but it is definitely an option. And, um, and especially now that the figure of ADVC is assist, I think. Great. Uh, so we have three final questions that we'll, we'll get to before our time is up. Um, so the first one is, what is public access like for the parks? And is there a movement for getting the public to visit the parks more? Um, so there are a few, so the, the, most of these places are not publicly owned, right? So whenever you go to a protected area, um, if there is the tourism infrastructure involved there or, or uh, um, developed, then you'll have these places that you know most people will be so like CN Cam, for example, has its community. You know, there's a community inside, and, and they've been working for years uh, to 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 receive tourism, and and so that can be visited no problem. But th that that notion that in the U.S. exists of like going to a public land to a national park and just going off trail and going backpacking, for example, or like going for days, that in Mexico it, it almost it's really com you know it's not it's not easy to do because you're always, so, always um, someone's property, right? Even if you're in a particular area. And, and depending where you, if you know the people around them, that's great, you probably, you know, they, you get to know them and they're, they're, it's okay. But in a lot of cases, you wanna be careful, right? Uh, and then you have to compound the problem that, you know, especially violence in Mexico has continued to rise. And, and so it's, it's, it's not advisable to go to a lot of, of these places. Um, now, there, there are others like the volcanoes that I showed you, for example, that are very popular. They're closer to cities where people go, and so then there's a point where you access a, a public land stretch. Um, but for the most part, you have to think that you're always on someone's property. And so uh, visitation to particular areas in Mexico is a bit different. Uh, and, and I think that is one of the reasons why uh, the, the success of tourism in particular areas hasn't, hasn't been quite as big as in places like the US or Costa Rica. Okay, uh, we have another question um, asking what has been done regarding poaching? Um, so I might not be the best person to, to, you know, to uh, reply to that, but so Profepa, which I show you in the graphs too, this budget is also being slashed. That, that's like the agency that enforces environmental laws and environmental regulation. And uh, they've always been understaffed 
but you know they 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 are the ones that are uh, chasing uh, wildlife trade and and enforcing the laws and um and and trying to relocate some of these species sometimes um but poaching is a difficult topic because um you know, uh, uh, probably Conan, because they have staff on the ground, they are the ones that usually know the most about where poaching happens. But then from Conan, for things to, to move up down to, to Profepa and then to be bring enforcement agents like the police, that takes a long time. It's, it's, it's a lot of bureaucracy. And again, it's, these are ejido lands that sometimes are the, main, the same ejidatarios that are defending their own properties uh, that get exposed to, to poaching. So. In a lot of cases, they'll say, you know what, I'm not going to miss, if you want to hunt, that's fine because I'm risking my life to do that. And that's because there's no enough presence from the Mexican government in these places. Okay, thank you. Uh, and our final question um, is uh, asking, is there any political pushback on the defunding of CONAP and the other environmental government entities? Yes, yeah, there was a lot and it was uh, really wonderful thing to see, uh, you know, that even through the, all the differences that might be between conservation groups and different things, when this started happening, you know, everyone jumped into the ring at the same time and put the gloves on. And uh, it, I mean, I think we managed to at least frozen some of the things that the decisions that, that uh, one, uh, uh, were trying to be imposed. Um, and so there's been a good, a good response from the community, but the, it's, it's, I, I don't think, you know, it's not going to go well anyway. Like we need to keep uh, uh, putting that fight. Uh, but there's been a really well coordinated uh, uh, response from the conservation community, but we for sure need more help from international organizations and more attention on the, on the international media. Great, thank you. Um, well, it looks like that was our last question. So thanks to, thanks to Paolo, first of all, for the great presentation and you're getting some applause. Um, and thanks to everyone for participating, especially if this was your first time. Um, as mentioned in the beginning, we do have a lot of other recorded coffee breaks from the past, and we have a great one coming up uh, next week as well. Um, so thanks to everyone for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day.